No one in God's great creation gives themselves over to Christmas more than Morley's neighbor, Mary Turlington. (laughs) To the season and the spirit behind it, to be sure, but not only to the season and the spirit, to the whole nine yards, to all the noise that surrounds Christmas. I've chosen my Christmas color, Mary announced triumphantly to her husband, Bert, one night in July. I'm doing cinnamon this year. Notice it's not we, not we're doing cinnamon. For Mary Turlington, Christmas is a solo sport. (laughs) We'll need a copper tree, she said to Bert a few days later. And catch that shift. An important distinction. Mary writes the score, but Mary expects her husband Bert to be in the band. By right of marriage, Bert is enlisted, inducted, and suited up. Mary, who's taken up with and over by Christmas every year, became particularly focused on this Christmas some six weeks ago. Until six weeks ago, Mary believed that her mother and her sister and her sister's husband and their four children and her brother and his kids were all coming to her house for Christmas. But one by one, her family bailed. Her brother got a new job and couldn't afford the time away. Her sister's husband got sick. Her mother called and said, I don't know, I don't know. If no one else is coming, maybe I should stay at home. Anyone else might have been disappointed. Anyone else so caught up in Christmas preparations might have fallen apart. What's the point, they might have asked. I work so darn hard, no one cares. Mary didn't fall apart. Mary dug deeper. Means we can do things my way for a change, she said to Bert. (laughs) Apparently, Mary, who had been all about control, had also been all about compromise. I thought I was going to have to do a turkey again this year, said Mary. Emma's so conservative on the question of turkey. On the question of turkey at Christmas, Bert felt pretty conservative himself. (laughs) But he was conservative enough not to admit it. Instead of being unsettled that her plans were unraveling, Mary was becoming unleashed. She was Mary unshackled. What do you think of Hannah, she said to Bert one night. Who, said Bert? If we hennaed your hair, said Mary. (laughs) Think of how nice you'd go with a copper tree. (laughs) Mary had apparently shifted into some previously undiscovered Christmas gear. And Bert, who had always been delighted by his wife's Christmas cheer, was beginning to feel something that was not delight. It was a bigger feeling than delight. A worrying sort of feeling. Fear. (laughs) Bert was fearful that Mary's Christmas was about to overtake him. He felt like the Cadillac in that song about the little Nash Rambler. Beep, beep, said Bert. What, said Mary? Oh, nothing, said Bert. As Christmas got closer, Mary set out their collection of Christmas candles. A parade of little paraffin men and women in chipped red and yellow choir robes. I know they're cheesy, she said, but I love these things more than anything. The candles had been in Mary's family since before she was born. Mary's parents had bought the choir master and his wife on their very first Christmas together a man and a woman singing their little paraffin hearts out. (laughs) Mary's mother had added to the candle collection each time she had a child. And when her children married, she added wax figures for each husband and wife, and then for each of the grandchildren. After 50 Christmases, there were now 23 candles that lived 11 months of the year wrapped in tissue at the bottom of a shoebox and spent the holiday season marching along the mantle, the two original candles at the head of the paraffin parade. Only one candle had ever been lit when Mary's sister's husband left her for his aerobics instructor. (laughs) Mary's mother burned his candle in the front window on Halloween. 
She scraped what remained of the candle off the window frame, wrapped the little wax puddle in beautiful gold foil, and mailed it to the ex-husband the following Christmas. <laughs> Ever since then, the candles have assumed iconic status in the family. Every Christmas, Mary's mother picks up her candle and says, maybe when I die, you could light mine and put it on my coffin. We'll never light them, said Mary. Never, ever. Mary found a, a local welder to make her copper tree. He came to the house and measured their living room door early in December. I won't be able to use copper, he said. I'm going to use steel. But it'll be oxidized steel, so it'll be copper colored. It'll look sort of, uh, sort of, uh, he was searching for the right word. Dead, said Bert. That was the night when Mary told Bert she'd settled on scallops for Christmas dinner. I'm going to poach them in saffron, she said, so they'll look nice with a tree. And that was the moment that galvanized Bert. That was the moment Bert decided the time for action had come. Bert was standing in his driveway when lightning struck. Well, not literally lightning, but close to it. There was a flash and a loud clap, and Bert jumped back, his hands flying up to protect his head. And then, as he stood there, a giant set of fiberglass reindeer antlers fell out of the sky and planted themselves in the front lawn right beside him. Bert stared at the vibrating antlers, thinking how ironic it would have been, given his current situation, to have been taken out by a giant Christmas decoration. <laughs> and then he looked up, and he spotted his neighbor, Dave, running down the sidewalk. <laughs> Dave with his face covered in soot and his eyebrows singed. <laughs> You'll never believe what just happened, said Dave. <laughs> and it was suddenly obvious to Bert what had to happen. Mary needed to be distracted or Christmas as Bert knew and loved it was going to be lost. And if Mary's family weren't going to show up and do the job, Bert needed someone else to take up the slack. Someone who rubbed up against his wife a bit, the way her sister did. Someone to preoccupy her. Hey, said Bert. Dave, how are you? And that is why, two weeks later, at two o'clock on Christmas afternoon, Morley looked at her husband across the mess of their living room and said, if we're going to get to the Turlingtons on time, we better start getting ready right now. <laughs>